Gavin Starks. I'm the founder of a company called Amy, uh, and our, our remit is to codify the world's environmental standards. But I'd like to start from a slightly different uh, place today and talk about the Internet of Things. This is, I'm sure you've come across the phrase, this is where all of the devices and appliances are, are becoming wired, they're becoming part of the Internet. And so the billions of devices that are out, out there at the moment uh, are all going to be wired somehow to the Internet. And when I reflect back to the early 90s and people were saying, oh, this web technology is fantastic, it's going to change the world. We thought, great, it's going to change the world, but we're not quite sure how or why or what it's going to be. And so there was a bunch of technology there looking for a purpose. And I really believe that the Internet of Things is part of a landscape that's coming to us that can help us to codify sustainability and help us deal with the fact that we're running out of energy, that we need to deploy a lot more resources to sustain a much bigger planet in terms of the number of people. So as we scale from 6 billion to 9 billion people and beyond, what are we going to do to really make our world more efficient and more effective? Give you a little bit of background about where I'm coming from. Um, Amy's remit here is to try and map the carbon footprint of everything on Earth, which sounds like a kind of crazy ambition, and it, it kind of is. But I used to work here uh, at this radio telescope in the UK called Jodrell Bank, where we're trying to map large parts of the universe. And so it feels in some ways, you know, we're trying to point the lens down the way rather than up the way, in this case, and look at what we're actually doing. And um, when I look at, you know, what I've done over the last 15 years working online, helping to bring huge amounts of data into a kind of networked world, um, looking at big data, uh, running businesses in, in that sort of area for the last 15 years. What happened was about five years ago, I was working with some climate change charities, and I looked at the data. I thought, this, doesn't, this story doesn't look good. I don't really want to talk about climate change today. What I want to talk, really focus on is, what do we do? Um, and Part of this landscape is how do we really build credibility around some of the information that we're being given and how do we build credibility around what we do next. Through some of the work I was doing with those charities, I had a very kind of unusual experience. Uh, out of the blue, I was called up by the UK government and they said, well, we'd like to come in and hear some of your ideas. So I went in, told them a little bit about what I was thinking about, and they went, great could you write a white paper for the Secretary of State for Monday? Just so you can, you know. <laughs> so I had an interesting weekend trying to work out, you know, how to describe data and the web and the Internet of Things five years ago to the Secretary of, then, uh, Secretary of State. And um, he signed off on that project and we got hard. Um, and then we, you know, from, from then on we've been sort of building out more and more sort of layers of this new sort of data ecosystem. So that's kind of the, the, the kind of bit of the backstory. And, uh, what I want to do is just give you a little flavor of what do, I, what, what do I mean by footprint and what do I mean by everything. So <laughs> everything is energy, any form of energy production, any form of energy consumption, which is quite a lot of things. Um, buildings, materials, agriculture, transportation, pretty much everything that we do as a species. Um, so it's quite, a, it's quite a big set of data. And only a small fraction of this data even exists today, but what we're trying to do is set some of the frameworks, set some of the foundation stones for how we can uh, pull this forward and, and enable a kind of new set of data to, to come out into the market. And just to walk through one example here, if um, you wanted to calculate you know, the impact of using 1,000 gallons of water, you can do that calculation quite straightforward. Uh, it's roughly a kilo uh, of uh, carbon carbon dioxide. Um, but what's the calculation behind that? How do, how do you know what that number means? Well, there's a few things that are moving targets behind uh, all of this data. One of them is, is the fact that it, it actually changes over time. So the intensity, the uh, environmental impact of using water changes from year to year based on the way it's produced and supplied and, uh, and how you use it. And in addition to that, it also depends on you know, whether it is a supply process or whether it's a water treatment process, etc. So these things, you've kind of got some complexity under the hood here, which there are thousands of research world, researchers worldwide who are pulling together all of this core research and putting in a huge number of hours to, to getting the underlying information right, but then they're doing something which doesn't really help, is they're releasing it as a spreadsheet and a PDF file. 
Um, and, and you know, if you're wanting to create a global ecosystem around data, spreadsheets probably not going to crack it. So um, what we do is we take all of these PDF files and spreadsheets and other random bits of information and put them into a web-friendly platform. And there's about seven million things in, in uh, Amy now that you can you can footprint against. The question is, what, what do you do next? So companies then use this information to work out how to be more efficient or how to reduce their consumption. You know, use it. There's a lot of things you can do. You know, maybe 50% of your, uh, the reductions we need to do can just be done by being more efficient. Um, there's also a process here, of, certainly in Europe, of offsetting. And offsetting's had a very bad reputation in some ways, had a very bad press. But it has helped a huge amount of money flow into an emerging market in the clean tech space and help to build wind farms and help, help to build uh, clean technologies. And if you look at that European landscape, there's a whole bunch of data uh, related to that deal flow. So there's $150 billion a year been flowing into the market, somewhat dwarfed by the over $300 billion a year uh, that our international government, government spent subsidizing coal and oil uh, last year. But you know, there's a good, good chunk of money flowing into this space. But you know, how can we really make sure that this scales? And how do we make it more than just about big industry? And how do we sort of take that forward? So um, if you unpack some of the, the data here, one of the key things that we like to talk about at Amy is provenance. Where did the data come from? So if you want to calculate the footprint of your car, there's a bunch of equations there. There's some raw data, things like how much fuel did you use, but how far did you travel? What's the efficiency of the engine? How inflated were your, were your tires? You see, we get really excited about detail here. Um, and for this particular uh, use case, there's the World Resource Institute, which is a fantastic organization that's been pulling all of this information together. But then that's based on data from the Environmental Protection Agency or the American Petroleum Institute or other sources. So there's a whole range of sort of vested interests further down the chain there. You want to say, well, you know, guys, what's actually forming the, the, the decisions that you're making? And can we improve this? And so we've been uh, working with governments around the world, uh, with, with businesses, to try and build this uh, sort of data ecosystem. And there's some, there's some impacts of sort of collating this. One of the first projects we worked on uh, with the UK government was to take data from, US, from, from UK households. And we took a lot of information in here from things like how much energy, how many uh, kilowatt hours of electricity are you using, uh, how many liters of fuel are you using, how many bedrooms have you got, what, how many windows have you got in your house, those kind of things. And all this data was populated by individuals going to a website and inputting it. One of the outcomes of that is we have this kind of heat map here of appliances across the UK by their efficiency. So the lighter patches are where we've got very efficient appliances in domestic homes. The darker patches are where we've got very low efficiency appliances. So if you're looking to create a campaign to say, well, let's improve the energy efficiency of this region, it's probably the northeast of England is where you need to start because that's one of the darker patches here. So there's some consequences of bringing this data forward that can really help to make and inform decisions. And what we see is all forms of consumption and activity data here are being codified. You'll be very familiar with the fact that your mobile phone knows where you are. You might not realize that just by knowing where you are and how quickly you're traveling, not only can we work out your mode of transport, but then we can then work out the footprint of that transport just by looking at that transport signal. And as these devices get baked into your cars, into your appliances, into your industrial processes, all of this is going to help inform better decision making. One of the initiatives that is um, now ex expanding around the world is Smart Grid. And there's a piece here of how do we make our energy infrastructure a lot more efficient? And we can do that, obviously, by putting devices in the home, putting devices into industrial complexes and saying, well, we'll manage the uh, utilization of power a lot more effectively. But that kind of misses one of the, the pieces here of what does that mean? So there's no point in sort of using the energy more efficient if the energy itself isn't that efficient in the first place. It does help. But one of the things, again, we do in the UK is we calculate the carbon intensity of the UK electricity grid every five minutes. And that's looking at the amount of coal, the amount of nuclear, the amount of renewables, and applying a methodology there which allows us to draw a graph like this. So here, 
the blue line is, is the carbon intensity over a 24 hour period. And you can see there's a higher proportional intensity of renewables um, on the left and a higher uh, density of uh, high carbon uh, coal plants, etc., uh, during the day as they spin up more power to deal with the demand. So as we look out into this, this kind of data space, we've looked at policy-driven markets. We've looked at individual survey results coming from you know, national campaigns. We can see data coming from devices, sensors around the world. We can see data coming here from the grid. And what happens when you start to tie these things together? Because this isn't about you know, just government taking the reins. It's not just about industry trying to act within a policy framework. It's not just about building the best new technology to actually sort of change the, the intensity on our, our, our environmental credentials. It's about how do we all engage. And so one of the prototypes here that we've been building um, is how do you bring this into an internet and a web connected age. So you've got people watching machines, you've got machines watching machines, you've got machines watching people. How can you weave it all, all together? And this is a, a prototype that we've, we've put together where you can follow the energy utilization of your social network. So integrated with Twitter, so all of the individuals in your social network have a smart device. Uh, they can all um, go in and uh, you know, one, of, one of the changes here is that it's not just the utility that knows your energy consumption. As we deploy these smart devices down into your home, there's two people that get access to the information rather than one. It's not just the utility, it's also you. And what can you do with that uh, information? And you know, one of the things you can do is obviously look at it and graph it yourself, and that's kind of interesting, but you're still sitting in a box and just saying, well, I can look at my energy over time. What we can do here is start to look at how, does, how do I compare with my neighbors on my social network? And can we create some gaming systems around this so that you collectively reduce your energy footprint? And again, it's not just about electricity. You could apply this to travel and transport. You can apply it to manufacturing and, and, and products. So I think that the kind of trend here that we're seeing is even if you don't care about climate change or sort of broad um, environmental kind of impacts of production, et cetera, there is a new category of data coming to market, and it's vast. You know, there are billions of sensors that are going to be giving us billions of data points around what we actually do as individuals, as groups, as local societies, and as countries. And it's all wired. And so what we, the challenge uh, for all of us is really how, how do we process this? How do we turn it into meaning? You know, we're already struggling with information overload. We're already struggling with you know, just the number of nodes of uh, information that we have to deal with. This is a new category of data that we can really process and help build in a more efficient set of rules to, to help us make, make decisions. So that's really the kind of core sort of nugget of, of what I'd like to get across today is how does the Internet of Things open up new potential for codified sustainability? And how, what services do we then build on top of that to enable us to scale our infrastructure and, and scale our resources to really meet the demands of the future? Thank you. My name is Gavin Starks. Um, thank you for